Let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Thomas Grenier. I'm the founder and the CEO of Equal Experts. Uh, Equal Expert is a network of software delivery consultants made of practitioners with years of experience. So really, we focus on people over process, I would say, if that's, that's not a tagline, we could be. Um, and it's really about people that are great at what they do. They come with an opinion, as you will see in a minute, and, and many years of experience. And, and it's all about investing in the grown-up culture that keeps, you know, give people freedom to stay in zone, but also the autonomy to do what they, what they do best. So today we actually have a panel. Um, we have speakers from all over the world. So actually good afternoon for the people in America, good evening for people in, in Europe, um, and late evening for if today some people from, from Australia. Um, so we have three lightning talks today from three wonderful speakers. We have actually Julia, who's based in London. Uh, that's, he says Licha, but it's actually it's Julia. She's at the bottom of the Oh, he does, doesn't it? <laughs> that's okay. I think I can rename myself. Yeah. At least she didn't leave a cat filter on the Zoom. We, we have Katie from uh, Atlanta and uh, Lisa from Boston. We're going to actually start with, with Lisa Copeland. Lisa is our head of product and design for the US, as you call experts. And I believe today she wants to talk, us, talk to us about Formula One racing. Oh, so yeah. I'll actually, I think, yeah, it's a, we, we can start, Lisa. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and room, room, let's get started. So the digital race is on and you know, how are we gonna keep pace? Oh, I'm not, okay, there we go. Sorry about that. But before we can race, let's walk through a couple of concepts. <laughs> here's me and here's my phone and my Apple watch and I'm connected all day long. And here I am and, and here's you, you're, you're coming in and we're connecting through Zoom. And we also have multiple devices and screens. And during this lightning talk, I'm sure you're gonna look at some and, and that's okay with me. And here's me and here's you. And here's the 7 billion plus people across the planet walking around with these uh, connected smart devices. Uh, you're coming into my home, here's my home and I can dim the lights if I'd like and I may start the car, it's cold here in North you know, United States, and I may start the car to warm it up when I have to run an errand after this talk. And when we step back, here's kind of the world view. We're, we're connected and we're interacting in so many different ways. And, and like, how did we get here? In the last 10 years, it's really been the power of the platform, right? That's driving a lot of this. And there are so many really smart people around the technical expertise around building a platform. But for me being around it for the last decade, I tease it up to connection. It's really about providing digital connection points that connect with you, connect with your customers, connect with your employees. And it's the ability to allow your organization and your tech stack to expand and extend, not to be brittle, hard and monolithic, not to lock into anything because the pace of change is so fast. And then there's the most important intriguing thing. It's the ability to learn and continuous, continuously learn. And some companies are doing it really well. I liken their platform to a rainbow. It's all rainbows for them. And we as consumers love it. We want more and we give and share so much of our di digital footprint. We're leaving it everywhere. But for many of us, it's a tangled mess. <laughs> the people and the tech and the process, it's all siloed and how do we start to unravel it? Well, we first start with building the foundations of the platform, right? Here it's, it's about the people, the process, the tech, but what's really important is they're stitched together in some sort of conformity, but it's really loosely coupled. And so then the same platform can deliver an experience for one business unit that looks like a kaleidoscope of flowers for their customer. And that same platform can deliver a pattern for another customer experience. But what's up next is kind of the concept of a digital ecosystem, adding new dimensions to our platforms, platforms on top of platforms. So here's your vertical platform, your core business, and companies that are really accelerating the pace of customer surprise and delight are also down here, building partnerships in their digital ecosystem to provide complementary services to their customer. And some of the things that are driving this change, the forces of this change is really the vastness of computer power. 
it's a lot and it's cheap. It's also the smallness, the miniaturization. We're walking around with sensors. Sensors are in our home, in our cars, on our body. And that interaction is creating data data everywhere. So we're getting some contextual learnings. We're just learning more. We're allowing our computer experience to be more human-like. And so as we, as we think about this, we wanna go fast all the time and we wanna learn how to put the pedal to the metal, but when is the right time to go full speed? So we're gonna talk a little bit about Starbucks, right? Initially, they started off with, as, a co as a coffee shop and now they're a digital shop, but really there's so much more you're gonna learn in a few minutes. And this is my lowest fidelity slide. So apologies for all how busy it is, but it really wants to, I really wanted to bring out a point that Starbucks, there's a timeline here, 2010 to 2017 is what we're gonna talk about. There's experience versus products over here. And there's also this kind of stream that you can see and tease out when Starbucks was able to have the idea of building their mobile platform and when they could really go full throttle, put the pedal to the metal. And, and it started with over here, kind of my rewards. How do we get customers loyal to us? And then they were like, well, let's provide mobile payment in store, a store experience that was somewhat different. And it took them a good three to four years to get to 26 million mobile payments, to roll out across the globe. And then something interesting happened in early 2015. They were able to take their first mobile order and pay. And in a mere six months, they rolled it out to the entire US. And then a few months later, they rolled out mobile ordering pay to China. So in one year, you could see they were full throttle. They were able to put the pedal to the metal, but it was really built on 2010 through 2014 as well. And you can also see where their focus was. They're a product company, right? They make food and beverages, customers like that, but they really focused that time frame that we wanted to collapse into what the features and the experiences were to keep that loyalty, to keep customers coming back. And where did that leave them? Well, by the end of 2016, we can call Starbucks a bank. They have $1.2 billion in assets competing with some of the other banks having more assets. Their platform, their mobile payment platform, which is the uh, Starbucks digital flywheel, it's really, they're a tech company. And in 2019, they went into some terms to provide their software to another company to go directly into new coffee shops, new restaurant experiences. It, I was surprised to find out that it took Apple Pay till 2019 to overtake Starbucks as the most popular mobile payment platform. Yeah, for 2015, 16, 17, 18, Starbucks was by far the leader in that area. And in 2020, on the banking side of the business, Starbucks earned $141 million. And that's another side of their banking. That's interest-free loans that they can invest back into their partnership, uh, into their platform and partnerships. That's taking their money and having it earn money in other places. And right before the pandemic, they were their data is telling them like some of the experience, they want that full throttle experience. So in the meat packing district, they opened up Starbucks Reserve, the world's largest beanery roasted coffee. And right around the corner, if you don't have the time, you can go to the first Starbucks mobile pickup store. No sitting down, no neighborhood coffee shop. It's just using your mobile platform. And when we step back, we can kind of see Starbucks here, here's their platform, but look at their ecosystem. They're just connected everywhere and the data is telling them where to go. And so as we, as we tease out, we want to go zero to 60. We want to go really fast, but getting to full speed takes a bit of time. And as we start to shift gears, another thing is sometimes companies have to know when to tap the brakes. Sometimes they have to know when to go a little bit slower. And so we're going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite companies, Amazon. And in the year like 2014, 2015, they had two competing devices. They had the Dash and the Dash One, and they also had Echo and Alexa. But what penguin is gonna hit the water first? You might be surprised that Amazon went with the Dash. So 2015, there was about 29 offerings with CPG companies. 
that for the first time brought Amazon into our home, brought product and shopping into our homes. And a year later, they had 150. But it wasn't about the dash and scaling the dash. What Amazon wanted was to get their customers used to the idea of a connected home, a smart home. And then they started reversing and focusing on Echo and Alexa. And Alexa 2017 to 2019, 60,000 smart home products were compatible with Alexa. To see it broken down in 2017, they had about 4,000. These are outside Amazon products that are embedding Alexa into their products. The convergence now of hardware and software. By 2020, there's 100,000. And now Alexa is like part of our family. We, we argue with Alexa. And Alexa is a continuous learner, learning our linguistics, our contextual language, not just deep learning, but really learning the humanness of how we communicate. But did Amazon bring the horse to the water and we said, nope, they tapped the brakes a bit. They understood where we were and they introduced new tech experiences that got us ready for the bigger change. And here at Equal Experts, we love digital platforms. So if you wanna know more, you can go check out our digital platform playbook. And I'm happy to answer some questions now, if there are any, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Lisa. That was really interesting. I had no idea about Starbucks and banking, to be honest. I was like, what? It's, yeah, it's, um, it's fascinating. Yeah, it, it's something else. Uh, we, um, so everyone, if you have questions, please use the Q&A you see at the bottom of the screen. You can click on it between participant and chat, and then you can type your questions directly there, and we'll answer them uh, in the order that they are. <clears throat> so actually, the, the first question was, uh, I think, how much do you think Starbucks knew in 2010 how, how far they were going to get to in 2021? Is it like something that they had foreseen, or is it just happened? Well, I, I like to say like nothing ever just, just happens. I think they, they had um, customer loyalty. And the one thing that Starbucks never loses sight of is like the customer. They don't do tech for tech's sake. And so they were always figuring out ways to get more information from the customer and how to, some wanted to move fast and some wanted to linger in their stores. And they also had a whole lot of data. This platform network that we talked about over the last 10 years created a whole lot of data. And so they could also see where the ecosystem was taking them. They were able to build networks in their store and they could see you know, the trends of in 2010, maybe there were 30 million smartphone de devices across the globe, right? And, and by 2020, it's almost the whole planet is connected by mm -hmm. smartphones. So they had also that information mm -hmm. to kind of inform that. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. The other question was about Alexa. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, the question, I mean, I'm paraphrasing it. Okay. How much do you think, so it's all about accessibility. Do you think Alexa comes for also from a requirements of trying to be more accessible than, because so many, these people that just can't use screens, right? It's not like everyone. Yeah. yeah. Or do you think that was that nothing to do with it? I think it absolutely had to do something. And I, and I believe that Amazon really felt that voice as a channel was something that was going to be new and they wanted to corner the market. So while they had their fire phone, it was a big flop. They couldn't mm -hmm. compete, right? With Samsung and Apple. And I think they learned from that. So it could have been the screens or it could have been like, we can't compete here. So let's entertain what would that new channel look like? And it was voice. So they took us along the step change of getting us used to talking directly into a personal assistant that's in our home, learning those command controls and being patient enough to know kind of what you had to do early on to get Alexa, Alexa learning. Mm. Yeah, no, 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 I, I, I can see that. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for your insights. Um, now we're going to move on to our, our second talk. So it's going to be uh, Julia. So Julia, Julia Bellis is a product lead that helps clients shape, uh, shape their vision. She's been in the network for over four years, if I'm correct. That's right. Um, and actually, Julia would like to explain to us that Florence Nightingale is actually a pioneer of Agile. So she's 200 brilliant. years old. Yeah, Yay. I will share my screen. Great. 
I hope everyone can see that. Thanks, so, Thomas. So again, sorry, Julia. Oh, if people right. want to put questions while Julia is talking and the, on the Q&A, feel free to do so. Go for it. So images like this one here on the left are really familiar. And even if you couldn't see the title of my talk, I think everybody would know that this is a picture of Florence Nightingale, the lady with the lamp as she's become known. But she was so much more than that. This really doesn't do her justice at all. And the vision of the lady with the lamp or the administering angel is a product of the Victorian PR machine because she became a real celebrity and they tried to package her up into a suitable role model for women at a time when the only career options available were wife or nun. And that is a joke that I got from a horrible history sketch, which is um, well worth checking out. So the aim of this talk today is to convince you all that way more than um, Lady with the Lamp, she was in fact an agile pioneer. And I'm going to do that by walking you through the agile skills that she demonstrated. Right, so deliver quickly to gain trust. It was Mike Bracken who said the strategy is delivery in a blog post that he wrote while he was at GDS. And I think if Florence had been a blogger, she'd have probably written the same thing. Um, and I'm going to tell you a story to illustrate that. So Florence and her team went on an arduous, difficult journey to Scutari Hospital in the Crimea. And when they arrived, they were met by the army doctors who said, sorry, you're not coming in. A hospital's no place for a woman. We don't, we're not gonna let you do anything around here. And when you're in this position where you don't have the trust or the authority to do the work that you want to do, there's two approaches that you can adopt. The first one is find a way to get something done while observing the constraints that have been imposed. And the second is to obtain the authority that you need to proceed as you want. And Florence did both of them. So she didn't take no for an answer. She negotiated with the doctors who were telling her to go away and they reached a compromise, which is why I'm showing you this picture here of a hospital kitchen. They agreed, okay, you're not gonna let us into the hospital, but we will let you into the kitchen. That is an appropriate place for a woman. And in fact, by letting Florence and her team into the kitchen, they were opening up a really juicy, meaty set of problems that she could get her head around solving. Um, the British Army in the Crimea were plagued by um, logistics problems. It was really difficult to get food to the front and communication problems. Once they got there, it was really difficult to find out what was going on. Um, so this was her chance to sort out supply chains um, and focus on getting nutritious, good food available for invalids in the hospital. And there's a really sad story um, about soldiers in the Crimea who were dying of scurvy. So the army arranged a shipment of nine tons of limes, which against the odds, made it to the front and were available there, but nobody knew what this shipment was, nobody knew what it was for, and the nine tons of limes were left to rot. So by letting Florence and her team into the kitchen, she could begin to get her head around these problems alongside introducing proper hygiene methods and sorting out the kitchen, and in fact was able to reduce the death rates before she'd even been allowed into the hospital wards. And at the same time, she uh, went for approach number two, which is obtain the authority to proceed as you want. So she was a very well-connected young woman and was a close personal friend of Sidney Herbert, the Minister for War, who had asked her to put together a team to go out to the Crimea. So she got in touch with him and asked him to issue the order so that she and her team would be allowed to do the work that they were there to do. And he issued the order, by the time it reached the hospital, 
They'd already observed the changes that she'd made in the kitchen and were much more likely or feel, felt much more able to trust her and believe that she could achieve similar results in the hospital. So when they were finally let in, this is the sort of vision that um, confronted them. And it looks pretty grim. Um, one detail of this picture that stood out to me was this depiction of noxious fumes here on the left, which I can only imagine are coming from the open overflowing cesspits that were at the edge of each ward. Um, and Florence Nightingale, if I digress for a second, famously was the first person to observe a correlation between lying in a bed that was near an overflowing cesspit and a reduced chance of survival. So what did she do when she was, a when she was confronted with this vision? She used her second agile skill, which is prioritize. So she chose the job to tackle that would have the biggest impact in the shortest amount of time. And the job that she chose for her and her team to do first, and this decision may have been influenced by the limited tools that they had available, was to remove all of the dead animals from Skutari Hospital. They found 24 of them, mostly dead cats and dogs, but one dead horse that was poisoning the water supply. And so just by doing this one quick win, top priority job, she could cut out deaths caused by drinking dirty water. And to give you a sense of the scope of her ambition and achievements, this is an image of a ward in the same hospital after it's been nightingaled. So way beyond removing she's brought in um, clean sheets, there's a source of heating, the windows are open, there's fresh air, it's a completely different place. Right, so we'll move on to her next agile skill, focus on a meaningful outcome. And the outcome that Florence chose to focus on was healthy soldiers. Initially, she focused on reducing death rates. This was what she cared about, but her ambition went way beyond this. She wasn't satisfied with simply improving chances of survival for soldiers in Skatari Hospital. She brought in a library so that they could educate themselves. She set up a programme of lectures and education so that they could prepare for another career after the army. And she even set up a system of banking so that they could send money home to their families rather than spending it all in the local bars. Right, um, this is one of the agile skills that she's actually fairly well known for. So Florence Nightingale was unusual for a woman of her time in that she had studied statistics from a very early age and she'd always been really fascinated with the power of data and particularly with using data to tell a story. And these charts are charts that she pioneered to tell the story of outcomes of patients in Scutari Hospital. <clears throat> and um, in these diagrams, the blue area represents death from preventable deaths, she called them, deaths from diseases other than wounds incurred in battle. So things like scurvy, cholera, diseases picked up in the hospital. Um, the red area represents deaths from battle wounds and the black area represents deaths of unknown causes. And there's all sorts of stories that you could unpack in this data, but the one that um, interests me is that when Florence arrived, ooh, that was a mistake, deaths from preventable causes were not being tracked. They just didn't count. So they weren't even recorded. And um, she started recording those sorts of deaths so that she could focus on reducing them. Work in progress limits. So Florence understood the cost of context switching. And there's a story behind this quote. So news of her success in the Crimea 
uh, broke in England and she became quite a celebrity. And the Times, um, utterly unrequested by Florence, set up a money raising service um, to raise money for Florence to come back to England and transform healthcare back home. And I've written down what they suggested to Florence. So they wrote a column in which they asked for a cut and dried prospectus detailing how she proposed to spend the money once it was raised. And this is her response. Um, I won't read it out to you because I think you can all read it. Um, but what she's saying is, let me focus on doing one job at a time and not get distracted with my next massive project. And even if I was to produce this cut and dried prospectus, this plan would only be altered or destroyed. I don't know enough now to come up with a detailed plan. And the alternative that she suggested was to learn through doing. The only plan I have is to put myself in the poorest and least organized hospital in London and there learn from experience how the money may best be spent. So she's saying, yes, you appreciate my success in the, in the Crimea, but there's no magic formula. You need to learn from the circumstances and adapt your behaviors accordingly. So to summarize, here is Florence Nightingale's agile skill set: Deliver value quickly to gain trust. Prioritize, pick the jobs first that are going to have the most impact and that you have the ability to deliver quickly. Focus on a meaningful outcome, but be ambitious um, and iterate towards it. Use data to measure success and tell stories. Focus on one job at a time or limit your work in progress and keep your planning to just enough so that you can uh, change direction if you need to and learn through doing. There's no magic formula. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julian. It was brilliant. It was a, you definitely convinced me about uh, her agile skills. But before, before I ask the question, what, um, how did you think of taking, of, of taking uh, her and, and looking at her from, a, from that perspective? What, what made you take Florence Nightingale? So, in actual fact, um, my seven-year-old daughter was really, was doing a topic at school on Florence Nightingale and was really interested in her and wanted to order a library book about her. And she ordered a biography of Florence Nightingale and we went to pick it up and it was about this thick. <laughs> so, <laughs> obviously she wasn't going to read it, but I decided to read it anyway because I thought it was interesting. And then quotes like the one about... Um, focusing on one piece of work at a time and any plan that I make now will be subsequently altered and destroyed, jumped out at me. And I thought, crikey, that sounds like agile. And then when you start looking for it, all of these behaviors became obvious. Mm. Oh, it's a very propitious talk for International Women Day as well, but the story is actually incredibly uh, relevant. Um, <laughs> So a, a couple of questions. Um, so, I mean, Julia, um, for, for you, what did, so Florence Nightingale obviously was very famous in, in nursing and hospitals. Um, but do you think all, some of the ideas, did they, did they impact other aspects of uh, the Victorian society? Or? That's you, become a, you are not a resident expert. I know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Florence Nightingale expert. So I would like to think she did, but the fact that she is still remembered and famous for being the lady with the lamp, which really just masks her real achievements, mm. I think is a clue that she didn't, so she's transformed hospitals and healthcare, and that second picture of her hospital ward that I showed you looks far more like what we expect a hospital to look like. But I don't think she was that successful beyond, beyond healthcare. Mm. 
She mm. was a very early celebrity, but she fled celebrity. She really didn't like being famous. And she called herself Mrs. Smith um, mm. whenever she went into a hotel after coming back from the Crimea. Uh, Lisa, I'm curious, is Fox Nightingale, is she famous in America or is it really a UK only uh, figure? Oh no, F Florence Nightingale is very famous here as well. Oh, okay. Just, yeah. Good. Um, yeah, she's one of those people that, that go across geographies. And yep. the, the next question, um, from all those learnings, what do you think is the most important agile outcome of all? Above, if there's one that's more important than others? <laughs> and then the other question you answered already. The one that I like the most is the deliver quickly to gain trust. And the fact that she demonstrated what she could achieve, even when she wasn't allowed into the hospital wards, I think was incredibly powerful mm. and turned around how people looked at her. She wasn't some strange fine lady who'd come from overseas in her fine clothes. She was, she meant business and she was serious and she could get things done. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Julia. I mean, uh, I think it's actually the second time, but I, I know it was even better the second time I, I listened to your, your talk, I think. <laughs> um, great, so now I'll start the last lightning, uh, lightning talk for the evening, um, or the afternoon, is going to be given by Katie, Katie Coleman. So Katie, um, I think you've been in the network actually over five years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and Katie uh, has been focusing throughout her career on smoothing the path of delivery, you know, building relationships with our clients, supporting consultants in all things uh, digital transformation. So don't let her British accent fool you because Katie <laughs> actually lives in Atlanta in the US, um, but she, she, did, she did spend some time in, in the UK, yes. So Katie, over to you. Um, what are you going to talk about? Thank you. Let me just share my screen and I'll just get that in. Presentation mode. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Great. So I'm going to be talking about reframing change a mile at a time. So it's a bit of a personal story. And like Julia, I've kind of found some parallels with Agile and the practices we use at Equal Experts. So a lot of what we do at Equal Experts is more than building products and digital services, more than software development. There's nearly always a change component in there, whether it's in the name of modernization, digital transformation, or simply going faster or improving quality or having more agility. So when we, you know, when we're thinking about this change, we think, well, how do we we've got lots of experiences and knowledge. How do we help our clients change? And what we know is simply just sharing information, sharing experiences isn't enough. And change is much harder than that. Um, as we all know, when we try to change our own behaviors, it's not that simple. So on that note, I began to think about how, you know, what changes, personal changes I would like to make. And I really wanted to, as with most of us, improve get fitter, have a better um, exercise routine. So I, in 2017, so a while ago now, it was coming into the new year, coming fresh off of the Christmas period, feeling motivated to have some uh, new changes in my life, um, New Year's resolutions. I thought, what, what could I do? What exercise could I do that I could actually stick at? Because I've done lots of different exercises before and nearly always would stop at some point weeks or months later. So in thinking about this, I came across the concept of a mile a day. And um, a few people said to me, what's the point? It's gonna be about 10 minutes of exercise. What difference does 10 minutes of exercise going to make? What meaningful difference would it make? Yet despite this, I did go ahead. And on the 31st of December in 2017, I completed my 365th mile. Well, actually a few more, but it sounds better that way. And it was amazing. I couldn't believe I'd actually stuck to a goal, like a daily goal like this of exercise. And I was living in the UK, so it was cold, rainy, snowy at times. And I, you know, had a busy schedule. I was commuting, had kids and working, um, but I felt, but definitely felt better, fitter. I was sleeping better. Um, 
and I could deal with stress better. Just those 10 minutes a day had this huge impact. And I sort of thought, this is great, but I started to sort of really be curious about this process. How has this worked? So in thinking about it, I realized that maybe within a few weeks, I'm not sure, I was really focused on the habit of getting up and completing the run. I wasn't thinking about getting fitter or losing weight, or I wasn't thinking of, I've got to run 365 miles. And I wasn't thinking about my performance. I wasn't saying, can I run faster? Um, can I, you know, I wanna do the fastest run today. In fact, I would change it. Sometimes I'd go fast, sometimes I'd be slow. Um, sometimes I'd go up a hill, sometimes I'd be flat. But I realized I was actually just focusing on the habit. And I thought, well, if focusing on the habit can achieve my goal and more, you know, what could that mean for other goals, other performance things? And that's where I started to look around thinking, am I, is this just something in my head or, or is there something out there? And then my friend Lisa here reminded me of Bruce Lee. And I found this wonderful quote that fits this, perf uh, this situation perfectly. And he said, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. So I wasn't doing any kicking, but in my case, I had practiced one mile 365 times. And so I thought this kind of resonated with me. And I wanted to kind of understand, you know, what's the science behind this? And to my wonder, um, Googling around, there's a whole world of, of, of information about habit formation. And I think um, this one really sums it up the best. So Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit, calls he's identified this thing called the habit loop. And I'll quote from him. He says, a habit loop consists of three elements, a cue, a routine, and a reward. Understanding these three elements can help in understanding how to change bad habits or form better ones. So I thought, okay, this sounds interesting. Um, what would this look like for me? So if I take my example of running a mile a day, I say, right, my cue was the alarm because I always did it in the morning as soon as I got up because trying to fit it in later in the day, too many other things going on. And I put my trainers on to get dressed straight away. So that's my cue, that's happening every day. Then my routine is the actual run, so that fits. And then my reward, was really that I was getting endorphins when I was running, just a natural process, always felt better after a run, no matter how I felt before. And I was getting this kind of dopamine hit from, I'd actually completed this task. And the more that went on, the more I, you know, that better, stronger that got, because I was, oh, I'm now 100 miles in now, I'm 200 miles in. So that's the reward. So I really thought this loop, this made sense to me. Um, so in thinking, about this more and I think well how can I can I learn from this in, and apply it to my work and then I thought well hang on talk about agile all day and I thought well there's some real similarities here if I think about some of the practices in the agile manifesto there's things like or the principles rather deliver working software frequently simplicity promote sustainable development and maintain a constant pace that all felt really, really similar to my mile a day. You know, I was delivering a result frequently, daily. It was simple. I didn't need to buy anything. I didn't need to pay for a gym membership. I didn't need to drive. And it was sustainable. And it was at a constant pace. So I started to think this small change for me had a big impact. And I could see it clearly. But I think in the workplace, it's maybe harder to see the impact of small changes. Um, but I really felt like there was something here. So in trying to look for more examples, I thought, well, what a perfect example of a habit as a daily, as the stand-up. It's a daily habit. It's really small. We do it, you know, normally as a cue of do we do it in the morning after we start work? And it does it happens every day. So there's the routine. And then there's an element of reward in that you get to share what you're doing for the day you get to talk about what you've done and you may get to help others or others help you so there's something intrinsically rewarding about that also looking at it from breaking habits point of view with kanban for example and as julia talked about you know trying to um you know 
look at behaviors that we may want to eliminate to increase better flow. So limiting working progress is an example. So that you know helps us to break habits around not starting more than we're finishing and not losing focus and not context switching. So I thought if we're adopting all these practices, which is what Agile teaches us to do, um, and they become ingrained as we see this all the time with our teams and we know it leads to better results. Um, so it all got me thinking, these are really habits. So I thought, what else, what other examples are there in the workplace to really test whether if we focused on creating habits in the workplace, we could get more meaningful, lasting change. And then there were a few examples, more contextual examples at Equal Experts. So we have one client, it's quite typical, where they want to move to more automation in their release process so that they can get software out there faster and get their feedback loops happening faster. But often standing in the way of that is change control processes, lots of paperwork, perhaps lots of fear about not try, you know, trying to control that process to make sure nothing can possibly go wrong. So that's often a hard challenge to, to, to overcome because people are fearful. But one of our teams came up with a way where if said, if we had a full audit trail on every possible release that you can view at any time, at any place, and it's easy to consume, could it make a difference? And we went ahead and did that. And over time, that became a habit of the people who needing to know about change would look at this dashboard of all the releases, full audit trail. It was easy to consume. It was simple. It, was, you know, it wasn't a big meeting, it wasn't lots of paperwork, kind of more enjoyable because it's nice and visual on a screen. And it you know, gave them what they needed, some reassurance around you know, the process of automation and releases. So I thought that's kind of an example of a habit. Another one is all around sort of user-centered design. And we had a client where everyone agreed we wanted to involve the users more in designing the products. Um, but despite that, often when we get feedback from users, some stakeholders would not like to take that on board, whether it may not meet what they were expecting or what they hoped for their own product. So to rather than focus on what, you know, the principle of user-centered design, we thought, what ways are there to actually embed this? And one example was to have the stakeholders join the user research session so they could actually see what was happening here, what was happening. And um, this became a, a regular habit. It was quite rewarding for the stakeholders because they could see the users with their products. They could hear what they were saying. And again, I think that was, and there's a routine to it. It's happening regularly. So I think that's another example of where you can introduce, introduce habit into the workplace to bring about a bigger change. And just one final one is really around um, stakeholder management. Often you have lots of stakeholders, you need to make decisions, but trying to get time with those stakeholders can be difficult. And for one client, we had lots of meetings. They were quite lengthy meetings. They could become contentious. And it was just taking up too much time and our teams became demotivated with, you know, not being able to get on with what they really needed to do. So we came up with the idea of a kind of clinic concept, a regular meeting with specific groups of stakeholders, where you could go to them with certain requests for decisions, sharing information, sharing progress. And this was a regular habit. And it was far more enjoyable than the big meetings. There wasn't so much preparation needed and follow up. And both parties, the stakeholders and us, it just became a much more rewarding process. And so it stuck. And over time, we saw our throughput increase because of that, because we're spending less time in meetings and more time with doing. So I really think these all provide some evidence that my theory that we can introduce habits in the workplace and think about change as habits um, could actually lead us to our goals. So perhaps if you find yourself in a similar situation, I think when I reflect on it, I think if you can find small actions to get you to a bigger goal, really, really small, think about them as a habit, think about maybe the cue routine reward loop. And I think that can really help reframe the change and very slowly. So a mile at a time to take my example. And just in case you're wondering, I still run a mile a day. This is three years later. And I know that's because the reward is still the same. The routine is still the same, but the queue is different. I run at a different time now. I've moved countries during that process, but
But because that, the routine was still the same and the reward was still the same, I could maintain that habit. So I think that's another great example. And uh, I've even run a half a marathon. And I think that's all because I started with a tiny, tiny little habit. And I think if we can find ways to do that in the workplace, we might get to the change we want quicker. That's it. And if you like habits, I'm going to give a nerd in the habit space now. There's a whole world of books out there. And here are just a few in case you uh, want to read more. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. It was really interesting. That the first time I hear uh, Agile uh, be described as a series of happy people. But now it makes sense. When I was a developer, I always wondered why my project manager always came with sweets at the end of the, the stand-up. She, she was just tricking us into getting there on time and being and getting some rewards. It, it, it worked totally, by the way. Um, no, that's, that's brilliant. Um, I heard of habit loop being described for things like Candy Crush. Right, thing, but not not for now, which makes does make sense. Yeah, you get it a lot in apps, don't you, where they focus yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, questions. So, actually, when you were describing, yes, the question, the example, your last one with your stakeholder, did you explain to them that you were trying to get them into a habit, or no, 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 <laughs> no but and at that time, no, not really. It wasn't. It was more, uh, you know, the regularity of it, so the routine. Mm -hmm is how we did position and did they notice the positive change yeah yeah because i think they got not only did our time get freed up but so did theirs and the relationship between us as, as groups really improved and they could see things were happening faster so yeah definitely it's a question from lindsay um how would an organist oops moving. how would an organization new to agile decide where to start with which you know which one of those loops to start with um, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, for in my experience, it has to be easy. So I think, you know, if, you, if you've got your goal, so maybe, maybe it's something really big, like digital transformation, something really vague, and you'd normally break that down into some smaller goals, and maybe there's some planning, but I would then break that down even further to say, what tiny, small change do we think could connect to that goal? Or maybe an easier place is to start with the undoing bad habits because they're already there and they're evident so when you look at breaking bad habits what you can do is keep the cue the same and keep the reward the same but change the routine so change the action and so as you know in my example with you know limiting working progress that that's a way to break you know an existing habit so that might be a, a, an easier place to start because you oh, sorry um, yeah, so it looks like psychology in the world's workplace it yeah. definitely doesn't seem useful. Another question, um, what are your thoughts on approaching, oh yeah, bad habits, oh there you go, you answered it. Um, the next one, what, what do you think makes some habits sticks and not others, assuming you know, if they're all small and easy? Yeah, what I makes a habit successful? Yeah, I think that... You have to sort of want it. So I, th I don't think it works if, if people don't want the change that you're seeking. So I think there needs to be some groundwork in an organization to get people aligned around the goal or an outcome, have them excited about where you're trying to head. If I, I don't think it works if you're not excited about it. I think the other thing is really to think about the reward. And that's the bit that I perhaps haven't really thought about in the workplace until this experience is really think about what reward is someone going to get out of, of changing this habit? And I think without that reward, you can keep repeating a pattern or a, for so long because you'll have motivation and you'll have willpower. But they, and in one of those books, actually, it talks a lot about that willpower and motivation decreases over time. As we all know from, you know, New Year's resolutions, really high motivation, then gets to maybe February, March, it's getting lower. So yeah. I think, yeah, keep really thinking about the reward. I think that's, Kind of hard in the workplace but you know we all want you know whether it's more time better interactions sure. more meaningful interactions there's some places to start there maybe well, that's really really inspiring i'm going to think about which habit i'm going to try and form <laughs> especially yeah. stuck at home so <laughs> i think it's, it's definitely something to think about thank, thank run, a mile. <laughs> yes, run a mile <laughs> every day that's the thing i like i never tried that. yeah um well, that, that concludes our, um, our talks today. I just want to say, uh, oh, is there another question? 
Oh, no, just uh, people saying thank you. Yes, the, thank you so much to all three speakers. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you, Katie, and thank you, Lida. It was really, really interesting. Um, I just want to let people know that there will be the next session is going to be on the 9th of March at 8 a.m. GMT. So um, better, I guess, for people in the, in the US as well. Uh, oh, no, sorry, it's to be way too early. Um, and it's going to be about business agility on company boards by, by Sandra da Davy. And Sandra wants to share her experience as a board member and a chairwoman. Um, and actually, she challenges you because she wants to demonstrate to you that actually company boards are much more agile than you, you ever thought they were. So that sounds like a really interesting session again. So thank you again. Thanks you again for everybody also that, that organized that behind the scene. I know Steve is still there making sure Zoom doesn't blow up and, and Sheila was there organizing everything. Um, and I uh, hope everybody has a great evening. Thanks again. Thank